I'm Terry Murphy for the Women's Wisdom Network, Senior Editor for Realty Times, Women in Business, Women in Real Estate, and in the Men's Room with Murph. And today we have a wonderful person in the Men's Room. You may have heard of him. His name is Mark Eaton. He played for the NBA. He's a huge basketball star. And I don't mean that in, you know, in, in inches. I just mean you... <laughs> You're ginormous and uh, for the Utah Jazz. And he wrote this fabulous book, The Four Commitments of a Winning Team. I've heard him in person. He is amazing. Welcome, Mr. Mark Eaton. Well, thanks, Harry. Great to be with you today. I'm telling you, we, we are the lucky ones. And when I saw you at the Leverage uh, event, I was so surprised at how much of the teamwork and how you started really was contributed and put in this book. And I would recommend that everybody get it. Uh, it's, this was a special edition, but I know that you've had many, many um, evolutions of it. So tell us, you started off, uh, and obviously we have to talk about the obvious, at seven foot four, which is bigger than my whole family stacked on top of each other. <laughs> Italians aren't that tall. Uh, you really became a team building expert. And tell us a little bit about how you went from auto mechanic to superstar. Well, uh, when I was in high school in Southern California, I didn't play a whole lot of basketball. I wasn't that good. I was growing very quickly. It was rather uncoordinated. And the coaches didn't know what to do with me. I didn't know what to do with me. And so when I left high school, I was probably 6'11 or so, close to seven feet. And um, there really weren't any options athletically for me. And so uh, I'd grown up in a home where we did a lot of mechanical work. My father was a diesel mechanic. And so I went to school, to learn a trade uh, for automotive, uh, how to do automotive work and spent a year doing that and was back in Southern California uh, working in a tire and auto center at now seven foot four, because I'd continued to grow until I was about 20 or so. And um, a junior college coach happened around the corner uh, to, you know, to this tire store and saw me standing out there trying to sell a brake job to somebody and uh, pulled in and was like, you know, what are you doing here? Why aren't you playing basketball? Which is what everybody asked me when you're 7'4". And I was like, go away, don't bother me. Uh, but he, over a period of time, convinced me to go out on the basketball court with him for a few minutes. And he showed me some things about the game of basketball that I'd never heard about before, which was how to play basketball as a big guy. And what's specific to them that's different about maybe some of the other players on the floor. And probably the bigger thing was he said, look, look, if you want to give basketball another try, I will be here for you. I will pick you up in the morning. We'll work out. I'll pick you up after work. We'll, we'll shoot some baskets. We'll do some different things. And that probably meant as much to me or more than the fact of the, you know, that the knowledge that he was trying to impart to me was the fact that he was willing to show me on a daily basis and be there for me. And so I, I uh, was a little reluctant at first, but I continued to work with him after work and uh, eventually decided to go back to junior college and spent two years doing that, moved on to UCLA for two years, and then was uh, drafted by the Utah Jazz in 1982 and moved from LA to Salt Lake City to begin my MBA career. And, um, and there's a lot more little stories in between all of that that didn't just happen overnight, but uh, but that's the, the general uh, overview of how I went from an auto mechanic to an NBA player. Legendary. Legendary. Legendary, Legendary. in my own mind, yes. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, there are so many people that have written about, about you in this book. I mean, Harvey McKay, Jeffrey Gittimer, uh, Rudy Rudinger. I mean, you know, Notre Dame superstar. It's really, though, uh, that mindset that you had early that you were uncoordinated, nobody ever tried to work with you. And I think the magic words were the support that this man gave you to open that door. And I think that comes through in your book about the four commitments. How did you start writing about this? What made you think that, uh, I mean, cause the book's a big job. I mean, we've written a whole bunch of them and it, it's a job to write a book. And actually it's not writing the book that's all the work, it's all the other work, including the cover and some of the, the this book is so much fun. You have to get it anyway. So, you know, besides the story, but what made you decide to put that in a book that you knew would go beyond the legendariness of your basketball career? Well, over time, um, since retiring from the NBA, I've done a variety of things and people all along the way have asked me, Hey, can you come tell us that story about how you went from an auto mechanic to an NBA player? And that was usually me just throwing some notes on a legal pad and going and visiting with the Kiwanis Club or whatever it was. 
And at one point in time, I said, you know, what would it be like to turn this into a, a speech of some sort that would really help people? And so that's how the conversation started. Only took me about four years to figure it out. Um, but I eventually found a coach who helped me distill what I was talking about into something that could really benefit other people. And the interesting part of that is as I, as I did that, and we kind of got some of the stories put together, but we didn't really have the four commitments, the points. We called my old coach from the junior college and, um, and asked him, you know, why did Mark make it when other people didn't? What was different about him? And he said, oh, that's easy. He knew his job. He did what he was asked to do. He made people look good. He protected others. And we were like, the big gong went off, like, wong, you know, like that's the, you know, and, and later, years later, I asked him again, do you remember saying that? And he said, no, I don't remember saying those things to you. Uh, but um, so that became the basis of the four commitments of a winning team. So that's, that's where that came from. And, and they're, they're simple things. Uh, they're things that are about you personally and your own personal accountability and paying attention to your, the gifts that you do have, along with being there for the people around you. And what I did while on the basketball court as a, as a center was I protected my teammates. I guarded the basket and, and I could give the other players the ability to go out and try and steal the basketball because if they missed and their man got by them, they knew that I would get between their man and the basket. And so I always had everybody's back. And uh, so I take that, that kind of information and, and that those, those insights of who I was and put that in this, in this presentation and in the book. Uh, dig a little deeper into that and interviewed a lot of people about how they applied those principles as well as telling my own story. And so it's a nice balance of my own story with some good business takeaways that, that can help you with your business and your career. Well, the magic is I've got your back. Because if you look right now, the world looks for safety. And it looks for safety for a number of things. Leadership is really about knowing that there's a confidence that you're going in the right direction and that the leader has your back. So I, I, I don't want to under, you know, just throw it into the four because uh, when you do what you're asked to do, which is integrity, and then you talk about making other people look good, it, it speaks to ego over the higher purpose. And then you go into protecting others, which is just, that just makes people melt because so few people have people's back that they can trust. Now you took that to another level when you started doing defend your team and improve your safety. Tell us how that transformed. Right. So uh, as I got out and started doing presentations, um, those particular concepts of being there for each other, making each other look good and protecting others fit well into the safety culture of um, construction companies, utility companies, steel companies, et cetera. Anybody has workers at risk on a daily basis. So it, it sort of evolved just by the fact of getting out and doing the speech. And so I, I mean, I've, uh, I've spoken in power plants and steel mills and utility companies and been all over the country uh, with that particular message uh, for that group of guys who are, who are there, who are really responsible for the lives of the people around them and for keeping job sites stay safe, et cetera. And so it's been, um, it's really, I, I really enjoy doing that because it makes me feel good knowing that I've given these guys maybe one more tool that's gonna help them do their job safely in, in sometimes some very stressful environments. Like, you know, I did one not too long ago in Oklahoma at this big uh, refinery and the moving pieces in that were just astounding to me. I mean, I just uh, took a tour of the place and I would just made my head explode after a while looking at all the moving pieces that made that makes that uh, process happen. Refineries. I have a, a chemical engineer friend. I've learned more about refineries and safety measures than I ever care to know and bless their hearts. No because, kidding. Yes. So that speaks to me about know your job, which is the first, uh, first one of the commitments. And what did you mean by that? Well, when I was a young basketball player, uh, you know, I kind of got my foundation in junior college and I went to UCLA and things weren't going so well there. I was kind of sitting on the end of the bench again. And, and, um, <clears throat> and during the summer, we play in these pickup games or practice games at the men's gym there in, in LA. And it was an old gym and built, built in the 1920s. And, uh, and some great, great players would show up there every day to test their skills against one another. And, and I was always found that I was kind of behind the play. Like I was always a few steps out of sync with everybody else on the court. And it was very frustrating to me that I couldn't figure out how to really engage and be a part, not just be on the floor, but be a part of the game. Right. And I, and I was pretty frustrated about that. And, and um, one day I was kind of on the sidelines, kind of feeling sorry for myself about it. And this, 
I felt this big old hand on my shoulder Well, and I turned around. It was Wilt Chamberlain, who's like the greatest basketball player that ever lived. And he'd, he'd retired from the NBA and still uh, a few years earlier and still would come down from his house up above UCLA. He lived up under in Bel Air and he'd hang out with us and, and still hoop with us. He was an amazing athlete. And he said, you know, stop trying to chase all these faster, younger players. He said, uh, come, you know, come with me in, in, out on the court. And he put me in front of the basket. And he said, like, your job is to guard this basket behind you. Make them miss their shot and collect the rebound and throw it up to the guard. Let them go down the other end and score it. And your job is to kind of cruise up to half court and see what's going on. And it was like this amazing light bulb went off in my mind where I took this complex game of basketball and trying to find my place in it. And he showed me exactly what my job was and what I needed to do to not only help myself, but to help my team at the same time. He said, that's something you can be successful at. And that little five minute conversation turned into a 12 year MBA career because I focused on that one thing that I could be great at. And I think sometimes we run around and we're thinking about all the things we should be doing. And we, many times we need to let go of a lot of that stuff. And what are the things that you already possess, the skills you already have that you just need to double down on? And so he, he took the mystery out of all that for me and gave me that clarity. And so that's what I call knowing your job, focusing on that one thing you're excellent at. Boy, what a gift. And, and, and speaks to the second one, which is uh, do what you're asked to do, which you say a lot of us look at our, strength, our SWOT analysis and we look at the weaknesses and we're like, oh, this is good. When, when we do have strengths. Uh, what did you mean particularly about that? Was that an integrity issue? Was that a commitment issue? Because it is. Um, well, I think sometimes we're afraid to ask what people really want from us, right? And um, and so I, I asked the question in that in that part of the presentation about what do people really want from you? How how clear are you about their request? And how well do you execute on their request on a scale of one to ten? And the back story of that is that when I was at UCLA and I wasn't playing. My junior college coach kept saying, you have to keep working. Like, you know, I know you're not playing in the games. You're going to have to make the practices your games. You're still going to be the first guy there and the last to leave. You got to do your running, your shooting and hit the weight room because this is not about right now. This is a long-term play. And so even if you're not playing in, in at college right now, we're still thinking about the NBA. We're thinking about playing professionally, even if it's like overseas somewhere, but you're only going to get there if you continue to work. And so I did what I was asked to do. You know, that's what he asked me to do. And even though there wasn't any immediate success around me, um, I kept that long-term idea. And I just said, I'm going to play this out and see where it goes. And yeah, sure enough, when I did have an opportunity to try out for an NBA team, they're like, well, you're a little rough, but I can tell you've been working and we're willing to take a chance on you based on that. And so that's why I call doing what you've been asked to do. So succinct and so perfect. So that brings me to the third one, which is make other people look good. So if you're doing your job guarding the basket, uh, tell us how somebody uh, in business today could, could you know, put that on themselves to do a better job of what they do. So when I first came to the Utah Jazz, we were a very bad team in a bad market. The team was on the verge of bankruptcy, had never had a losing or never had a winning season and averaged about 5,000 fans. And in the NBA back then, if you were to be successful, you know, you'd get on the floor and try and see how many points you could score, how many minutes you could play. And at the end of the year, your agent would take that and say, well, hey, he scored this many points, he played this many minutes, so therefore he should get this much money, right? And our coach, Frank Layden, who had taken over, who was uh, from Staten Island, Brooklyn born, New Yorker, and um, very blue collar work attitude and ideas about things. He said, you know what? He goes, if you guys would stop, he'd say, if you guys would stop competing with each other so much out there on the floor and start cooperating with each other, the individual accolades would follow. And he took a guy, a group of players who were relatively unknown, with the exception of maybe a couple of players that, that, that were, you know, had some star quality and convinced us to stop being just so concerned about our personal stats out on the court and be more concerned about whether we won the game or not. And sure enough, we won a few more games that year. The next year, we win the division for the first time. We make the playoffs for the first time in team history. And we have four individual statistical leaders in the NBA, which is a feat that's never been accomplished since, simply because we started playing as a team. 
And so um, I call that making other people look good. And I challenge people and say, well, how focused are you to make the people you work with look good on a scale of one to 10? Like, what are you actually doing for them? And I challenge people when I coach businesses to get out of your cubicle or get out of your office and go visit with the other department heads, go see what's going on in accounting and, and how you might be able to help them as opposed to just firing off emails of where's this and where's that. And that, that camaraderie that comes, that feeling that comes from that is what we talk about being in the zone and really building that team unit. And I think sometimes the word teamwork is overused in business because it's really about that commitment um, from me to you about making you look good. Well, that is a beautiful way to put it because we coach teams, all, as you know, all the time. And that puts a different spin on it. Clearly, the legacy piece is the result of everybody working together. But at the very basic of it, you do your job, you do it right. So we've got that part down. We're going to make you look good because we all know what we're doing. So there's no confusion. And then at the end of the day, uh, we're protecting each other. And so there's no ego. So the ego goes away. I, I think it's a, a remarkable that that statistic has never been reproduced since then. Yeah, it is remarkable. And, and again, I think it just comes from the standpoint of, you know, the person four offices down might have the answer that's going to save the company or, in, in, you know, create the new big wow. Um, but if they don't feel comfortable coming in your office and sharing that with you simply because everybody's so compartmentalized in their thinking, uh, you'll never hear about it. And so you've got to be able to break those walls down and break those barriers down. And the more team things you can do together to build that camaraderie. That's what worked on the basketball court, right? It was the, the friendships that still, uh, you know, uh, last to this day. Uh, and uh, the relationships that you built over time um, that really make the sweet spot happen. And I think that's what um, we need to get back to. Well, the, you've done such a great job. And I love the fact that John Stockton wrote the forward to that as well. There's some great, there's some great stories that you share in here. But at the end of the day, it's really about, you talk about the commitment, it's really the combination of willingness, knowing your job, operational excellence, and then making sure everybody knows it's a safe place. Because when you pull that, when you know, the thing that's so exciting about a team is that the whole team wins. It's not just the Michael Jordans or the Mark Eatons. And so I really think that in this particular book, you did a spectacular job of helping us understand that. Now, you, like I said, you went on to do more safety because uh, you talk about honoring the members' strengths and the critical role they play. What do you, how do you honor somebody's strengths? Um, I think uh, acknowledging them uh, for the, the great job they're doing. Um, if, you're, if you're in a review process, uh, spending some time focusing on what people do well rather than what's missing all the time. Um, and, uh, and letting them know that you're there for them. Um, you don't have to go out to dinner with somebody every day, but you do need to let people know that you have their back and they can come and talk to you about anything and, they're, and, and it's not going to be repeated. There has to be a place of confidence. And I think that's, that's what people are looking for. They just want to know that, that they matter, that their contributions to the company matter. Um, and that you uh, are aware of that. And, you know, and everybody wants to make more money. Sure. And you do that with the team successful, everybody wins. But I think by and large, that individual acknowledgement and taking time to just get to know people on a slightly different level, uh, finding out what their aspirations are, what their career goals are, and finding a place of alignment where you're looking at the horizon together is what it's all about. I think that just sets it perfectly because my question was going to be, you talk about employing the principles and coaching techniques that, that coach people up. And uh, we know that leaders, their big job is to make other leaders to help and, and grow other leaders. And I think you did that extremely well. Um, Mark, uh, you know, it's, it's a gift to have such a legendary career. It's a gift to have transformed from, I would say, I don't want to say ordinary, but ordinary to extraordinary. And then to be able to leverage this kind of experience to other people. What's the best way to reach you? If somebody wants you to speak or if they want you to do some coaching or consulting, I bet it'd be fun. Um, it is fun. We have a good time. Um, all you need to do is remember how tall I am, seven foot four, because that's my website, sevenfootfour.com. That's the best place to, to find me. Uh, you can Google me, Mark Eaton, uh, as well, and you'll, it'll come up. Uh, and then it's easy to contact me through the website. And of course, the book is available on Amazon. Yeah, Amazon, Audible, Kindle, all of those uh, formats. So yes. 
Excellent. Well, Mark, I can't thank you enough for sharing your time and your wisdom with us here at Realty Times Women in Business, Women in Real Estate, and of course, in the men's room with Mark. I hope you'll join us again for another segment coming up next because I know there's just another book in you somewhere and we <laughs> want to have first dibs. Uh, deal. Well, thank thanks, you. Sherry. It's great being with you.